Good morning. It is nine o'clock Central Standard Time. I want to welcome you to the Dallas School of Environmental Education Center for a field trip. I want to say a very special welcome to Molina, uh, Dallas ISD. Teachers, if you're watching, you have not registered, please do so. Go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC register and sign up. This is just for our attendance records. Uh, we're going to do a program this morning called Environmental Impact. During this virtual field trip, students will explore the impact of human activities on the environment. Students will investigate causes and types of air, soil, and water pollution, including point and non-point sources. Mr. Monroe will talk to you about water quality. Ms. Ramirez about air pollution, Ms. Fuller about soil pollution, and Ms. Nash about water pollution. And we'll have a special program this morning. And uh, uh, we will not be able to ask us verbal questions, but you can go to www.tiny.cc slash EEC uh, space question, space answer, send in your uh, question and I'll do my best to answer them during the program. If not, I'll send the answers to your teacher and your teacher can share them with you. Now I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Mr. Monroe is going to talk to you about water quality. Good morning, students. My name is Mr. Monroe and today we're going to be looking at water quality. And I really wish you guys were here today with us, uh, basically to study, study water quality. It's a program called Limnology, the study of fresh water. And of course, if you were here today, we would be going out to interact with the bodies of water that we have behind the Environmental Aid Center. We have two working ponds and a lake that is found in the Post Oak Preserve. And we would be going out and running some tests to figure out the quality of that fresh water. Now, again, the study of fresh water is called limnology. And basically there are two types of fresh water that basically is really used in our world today. Groundwater, which we know is trapped in the ground and surface water, which is water that we can see on the surface like our ponds and our lakes. And that type of water, our fresh water, the surface water is split up into two categories. Lentic water, which is uh, an example would be our ponds and our lakes because they're not flowing, they're not going anywhere. And then we have the other type of surface water, lotic water, which actually is moving water, for example, like a creek or stream or a river. Well, to help you get a better understanding of what type of tests we would be running to determine water quality, I'm going to uh, show you a short PowerPoint. And uh, bear with me as I share my screen with you guys. Water quality. How are physical and biological factors used to determine water quality? How do we know if the water is safe to drink? How do we know if the water is safe for aquatic organisms? These are indicators that we would use. Temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, nitrates and phosphates, turbidity, and bio indicators. And at the very end of the PowerPoint, I'm going to be giving you a list of bioindicators we would use to determine water quality. Causes of temperature change could be the color of the water, dark colored water or dark muddy bottoms absorb more heat, causing the temperature to be maybe abnormally high. Water depth is another uh, factor. Deep waters usually are colder than shallow water simply because they require more time to warm up. And of course, along the, along the shoreline, you're gonna find vegetation and trees that will shade or cover water, preventing, them from, preventing the water from heating up. And location and time of the year is a definite factor 
that will determine what type of water temperature you're going to have. Effects of temperature change. Temperature affects oxygen carrying capacity of water. As the water warms, the amount of dissolved oxygen decreases. If high temperatures are combined with low dissolved oxygen levels, the toxicity is increased. Dissolved oxygen is oxygen that is dissolved in water. It gets there by diffusion from the surrounding air, aeration of water that has tumbled over falls and rapids, or maybe even the wind making uh, waves on the water could generate some oxygen, and waste product of photosynthesis, meaning the water plants or aquatic plants are going through photosynthesis and putting out that byproduct that we call oxygen. Fish and aquatic animals cannot split oxygen from water, which we call H2O. They can't separate. Causes for lack of dissolved oxygen would be, you know, warm water holds less oxygen. Could be overpopulation, too many organisms using dissolved oxygen. Overfertilization of water plants by runoff from fields containing phosphates and nitrates. Effects of dissolved oxygen. Dissolved oxygen below 3.0 parts per million, that is the unit that is used to measure dissolved oxygen, can cause the most versatile fish to die. High dissolved oxygen in a community water supply makes drinking water taste better. pH is the measure of hydrogen ions uh, H plus concentration. The pH scale runs from zero to 14. Pure water has an equal number of H plus or O plus OH ions, which makes it neutral. So in a sense, we're saying that pure water usually registers at a 7.0. Most aquatic organisms exist within a pH of range of 5.5 to 9.5. And we like to see our ponds somewhere between 7.0 and 8.5. Causes of change in pH, lakes or ponds, which are lengthy, age the chemicals discharged by communities and industries. industries. The effects of pH, more acidic water can kill certain aquatic organisms. A change of 0.3 units a day can put fish into shock. And that's why a lot of people measure the, the uh, pH level in their aquariums. They want to keep it steady and consistent. The element phosphorus is necessary for plant and animal growth. Phosphate concentrations in clean water is generally low. Causes of high phosphorus is fertilizer coming in from runoff, detergents, natural mineral deposits that may be found in the bottom of the body of water or in the surrounding land. Effects of high amounts of phosphates can overstimulate growth of aquatic plants. This will cause high oxygen consumption and death to fish and many aquatic organisms. Nitrates are a form of nitrogen and its primary is a primary plant nutrient. Excess nitrates cause algae blooms that reduce water quality. Causes of increased nitrates could be wastewater, fertilizer from runoff, discharge from car exhaust. And we have actually in the past or the history of the Environmental Ed Center, at one time we had septic tanks. And uh, one time we got so much rainfall, our septic tanks were covered. And as it ran off into the pond, we had a tremendous algae bloom. Effects of increased nitrogen. It stimulates the growth of plankton and water weeds that provide food for fish, may increase the fish population. If algae grow too wildly, oxygen levels will be reduced and fish will die. Nitrates can reduce to toxic nitrates in the human intestine. And many babies have been born seriously poisoned by well water. Turbidity refers to water clarity. Sediments suspended and dissolved in water 
in the water decrease the amount of light that is able to pass through. Causes of uh, poor turbidity is soil erosion of agricultural lands, forest soils exposed by logging, degraded stream banks, overgrazed gra uh, rangelands, strip mines, and construction. And plankton. Effects, it interference with uh, sunlight penetration in the water. Large amounts of suspended matter may clog the gills of fish. It would be like you trying to breathe in a dusty room. Suspended particles may provide a place for harmful microorganisms to lodge and reproduce. And difficulty finding food may make it easier for fish to hide from predators. And I will say this, our ponds do not have any plants growing or aquatic plants growing on the bottom of the ponds, simply because we do have uh, poor turbidity, which is not allowing sunlight to reach the bottom of our ponds. And therefore, there are no plants because we know that even aquatic plants need sunlight. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen at this point. And there are some biotic indicators that are indicators that your water quality could be good or bad. We have organisms that are very sensitive to pollution and turbidity, turbidity, and we have some that are somewhat sensitive. Here's just a few. Uh, if you find mayfly nymphs, stonefly nymphs, caddisfly larvae in a pond or a body of water that you're wondering about, the quality of it, then guess what? Those guys, the ones that I just mentioned, are very sensitive to pollution. So if they're there, that's an indicator, probably you've got good water. And then we have a group of organisms that are not so sensitive. They're somewhat sensitive. And uh, dragonfly nymphs, scavenger beetles, clams and mussels, back swimmers, water striders, and crayfish. If you've got those organisms, then uh, you have moderate levels of pollution or turbidity and the water is still considered to be healthy. And then we have some organisms that are really tolerant. And I have two examples of those. Mosquito larva, they can, they can just about tolerate anything. And then leeches. There have been times when our ponds have been very low and the water has become stagnant that we've actually found leeches. And then I have a little friend here that I'm going to show you as I close. This little guy is truly an environmental indicator. And this is Hoppy the bullfrog. You know, frogs, they have a three-chambered heart. And uh, once the frog is an adult, they sit around the edge of a pond or a body of a water for uh, a little bit. And basically what, has to ha what is happening is because they have a three-chambered heart and their lungs are not uh, able to furnish the frog, the body, enough oxygen, they actually have to take oxygen through their permeable skin, which has to stay moist. And if there's any toxins that are coming in, the frog can't exist or it will die. And if you've got bullfrogs around a pond or a body of water, that is another <laughs> environmental indicator. Now, if any of you have any questions, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Gorman and maybe he can answer those questions for you. I want you guys to have a good day today and enjoy the rest of your virtual field trip. Thank you, Mr. Monroe. And we do have a question, very interesting question. Who has the best drinking water in the world? Okay, and it is Switzerland. Switzerland is repeatedly recognized as a country with the best quality tap water in the world. The country has strict water treatment standards and superior natural resources with an average rainfall per year of 60 and one half inches. In fact, 80% of the drinking water comes from natural springs and groundwater. So if you want really good water, move to Switzerland. Now, Mr. Maris is gonna to talk to us about air pollution. Hello, my name is Mr. Maris, and in this segment, we're gonna be learning about air pollution. So before we start our presentation, I do have an animal guest that I wanna show you guys. His name is Spike and he is a bearded dragon. Uh, but something interesting that I've learned is that climate change and rising temperatures 
um, of course, due to greenhouse gas emissions are actually causing or affecting bearded dragons in Australia. So the sex determination of bearded dragons can actually be impacted by rising temperatures. And so what studies have found is that when temperatures are between 93, 99 or above, it's causing the male embryos um, to become or turn actually female. Uh, so climate change can not only impact just the we typically think of uh, polar bears, uh, but they can affect other organisms as well. And of course, this can be detrimental to animals like the bearded dragon because it severely affects um, the sex ratio of these animals. So there's going to be more females than there are males. Uh, so this is Spike the bearded dragon. And again, they're originally native to Australia. They get that name because they have a big patch or beard of skin underneath. Uh, their chin and they will inflate that when they feel threatened. Uh, so that is Spike and he's ready to go. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and share our screen with you guys and we'll start our presentation. I do have a couple of essential questions for y'all. So hopefully by the end of this presentation, you'll be able to answer these two questions. The first is you should be able to name three air pollutants. And the second is you should be able to identify some ways that you what you can do to help preserve our air quality. So we know that clean air consists mostly of nitrogen, oxygen, and of course, small amounts of argon, carbon dioxide, and also water vapor. But when harmful substances build up in our air to unhealthy levels, we have what's called air pollution. And much of this comes from human activities, but some of them can be natural sources. So before I show you the next slide, see if you can think of some examples of air pollution. I'm going to go ahead and move over to our next slide. So take a moment just to observe, make some observations about what you notice are some sources of air pollution. Again, feel free to pause the video to allow time for a discussion, but I'm going to go ahead and go right into it. So hopefully you guys are able to notice that we have what are called primary pollutants and then secondary pollutants. So the primary pollutants are those pollutants that are put directly into the air. So for example, uh, the soot from smoke or carbon monoxide from cars. Then when those primary pollutants react with other primary pollutants or when they combine with other um, gases that are just naturally in our air, they can combine and form what are called secondary pollutants. So again, those secondary pollutants are just forming when we have a combination of multiple pollutants uh, reacting or combining together. And then we also have a point source versus non-point source. And a point source just means that that pollution uh, comes from a single identifiable source. So for example, if someone had um, a leak in their septic tank, uh, we would be able to identify that as the cause of the pollution uh, for that home. Then we have what are called non-point source pollutions and it makes it a little bit harder to identify who's responsible for that pollution. Um, so this type of pollution can come from many different sources. So for example, think of street runoff. Uh, that street runoff could come from any number of individuals along a house. Maybe they were uh, doing an oil change on their vehicle and didn't properly dispose of oil. Uh, it could be water leakage or sewer leakage. Uh, so non-point source solution just comes from a variety of different sources. And hopefully you guys are able to notice that uh, a lot of our pollution in the air is coming from man-made activities, but also there are some natural causes, for example, volcanic eruptions, wildfires, and things like that. It is important to note that one-third of air pollutants do come from vehicles, and uh, power plants release about two-thirds of all the uh, sulfur um, dioxide into the atmosphere. And then those are some of the common effects of air pollution. So on your own time, you can take time to research how those effects impact plants, animals, and people. And then something else that impacts our air pollution is what's called temperature inversions. And that is simply uh, when pollutants are trapped near the Earth's surface. So you can see here, this is under normal conditions, the warm air. Uh, will rise and normal winds will help to spread out those pollutants. However, when we have a temperature inversion, uh, that warm air and the pollutants end up getting trapped by a cap. And that is what creates our smoggy days. So in 1952 in London, there was called, uh, it was called the Great Smog and it lasted for five days. And scientists think that anywhere between 4,000 and 12,000 people might have died uh, from bronchitis, pneumonia and asthma related to that 
great smog. And then some couple of things that you guys can do on a smaller level to help with air quality would be things about conserving your energy, uh, riding a bike, carpooling, um, also planting trees. Uh, so those are some things that you can do on a smaller level. And then if you ever watch the news in the morning, you might see the meteorologists have an air quality alert. So pay attention to those. And this is just the air quality index. So when we have days that are orange, red, or maroon, those are bad air quality days. And they typically advise us to stay um, indoors. And again, those are typically because we might experience one of those temperature inversions and it makes the pollutants a lot worse. So my at home activity, uh, I would like for you guys to visit these two websites and I'm going to show them to you guys really quickly. Uh, but also here recently last week in the news, uh, the American Lung Association uh, put out their annual report. They gave Dallas a letter F for the ozone pollution. So that means uh, bad smog in Dallas. They gave us a letter grade of C for particle pollution, meaning we had between three and five days uh, at the orange level for air quality but we actually passed overall for the particle uh, pollution annual wise. So that's uh, something else that you guys can look into for your own city. So let me go ahead and show you guys those two websites super quick. This is the first one, it's World Air Pollution Real Time. Uh, so this is for today and you can see uh, our color keyed here. So it looks like Mexico is having some unhealthy days today. Um, and then you can see it kind of moderate and green over here in some of the areas as well. But you can actually explore other regions of the world uh, to compare that. So that's the first site. The other one is to give you an idea about what we mean by air particulate particles. Uh, so here's the floating particles uh, for good air quality. And if you scroll on down, this one is set for Dallas. Here's what the air particle uh, looks like for Dallas. So you can see there's more particulate matter. So it's moderate here in Dallas. But if we compare Dallas to say, for example, uh, California in the Bay Area, this is how dense the particulate matter is um, over there. And then lastly, in India and in New Delhi, compared to the particulate matter there. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing our screen. We're gonna give it back to Dr. Gorman uh, to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Ms. Ramirez. Uh, in the past, many times I have flown into Los Angeles, California on an airplane. You're up in the sky, the sky's beautiful and the clouds are white and everything is just gorgeous. And all of a sudden you go down through this brown layer of smog and uh, you, you don't even know what happened. I mean, you can't see anything. It's horrible out there on some days. Um, now, the, now, the question, I think it might be the same student, which country has the cleanest air in the world? Okay, we know Switzerland has the cleanest water. Okay, the Bahamas has the cleanest air in the world. The Bahamas have the cleanest air in the world, followed by the territory of the U.S. Virgin Islands, then Iceland, Finland, and Estonia. And I don't even know where Estonia is. Okay, thank you again, Ms. Ramirez. Uh, guys, it looks like we can't live in a country that has the cleanest air and the cleanest water. So I don't know what we're going to do. Now let's let Ms. Fuller tell us about soil pollution. Good morning, boys and girls. We're gonna talk about soil pollution in this segment. So let me very quickly share my screen with you. We're gonna talk about two really significant um, soil pollution issues in Texas. So what is soil pollution? Um, well, soil pollution is when, um, poisonous things are dropped into or uh, incorporated into uh, soil that will have a hazardous effect on the environment and then of course on people and animals. Uh, I have a quotation here from President Lyndon Baines Johnson. If future generations are to re remember us with gratitude rather than with contempt, we must leave them more than the miracles of technology. We must leave them a glimpse of the world as it was in the beginning, not just after we got through with it. So it's, it's important for us to keep in mind that we all are stewards of the world and it's important for us to take care of and prevent air, soil and water pollution. I'm gonna to talk to you briefly about CERCLA. This is also known as the Superfund Act. CERCLA stands for Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation 
and Liability Act. It was passed in 1980, and the Superfund Act has two goals, short-term removal of the, the pollution and long-term environmental remediation. Let's keep in mind two, uh, two essential questions. Name three soil pollutants, and number two, how can soil rem remediation be safely carried out? So the first one we're gonna talk about is here in Dallas. It was the RSR smelter. Uh, it, uh, this was the West Dallas Superfund site and the pollutants that were left behind when the RSR smelter closed in 1986 were lead, cadmium and arsenic. And the, the neighborhood has essentially been contaminated for about 50 years. RSR opened in 1936. The uh, smelter had to be shut down and the contaminated soil taken away and the site had to be reclaimed. Uh, so what the EPA did, they hired a company to come in and they tested about 7,000 sites there in West Dallas and they removed the top six inches of soil from about 400 different uh, residences and bu business, uh, buildings and they, um, uh, transported that out to Ellis County and dumped it, which I'm sure the people in Ellis County were thrilled about. Um, what the RSR smelter did was it uh, rehabbed or smelted down the lead in uh, car batteries. And so there was a lot of slag left over after the process, after they you know, you know, smelted the lead and sold the lead, then they had all this slag left over, which they threw in a big pile right beside the smelter. Now, uh, I grew up on the Texas Gulf Coast and a lot of people where I grew up had gr uh, driveways that were paved with oyster shell. Well, here uh, people were taking the slag and they were paving their driveways with the slag left over from the smelting process, the problem was it was full of lead and it got into the soil and the children played in the soil. And as you know, children put their hands in their mouth. So there were a lot of kids in this neighborhood who got lead poisoning from the smelter, either from the lead falling out of the air or uh, from the slag. And uh, lead, your body cannot tell the difference between uh, calcium and lead. And so these kids had lead deposited in their bones. Lead is very toxic to humans. It can, it can destroy your kidneys, your blood making mechanism and your brain. So it can cause uh, mental retardation. Uh, it can cause um, all kinds of dreadful uh, aspects to, to damage people's lives. So um, when this site was uh, cleared up uh, by the CERCLA Act, the Superfund Act, uh, they had to, uh, if you remember the CERCLA, it says Liability Act, um, they had to pay these families so that their children could receive uh, medical help for the, the problems that they received from the lead. Now this area has a prevailing southerly wind. So the smokestack went out into a Northwest direction and dropped this lead in a cone shape. So it was very easy for them to find where the contamination was. Uh, the, uh, the RSR smelter abutted the uh, DISD property where Edison Middle School is. And so all of that was part of the Superfund cleanup. And um, uh, now they have built a 7-Eleven on top of the site where the RSR smelter was. Now this is another one. This is down in Pearland. It's, this Superfund site is called the Dixie Farm Road um, Brio site. And this, this was a site where there was a refinery and uh, the refinery refined things like in reclamation, they would take uh, things and uh, um, distill them down. And they didn't know any better. This site was in operation for about 50 years and they kept the raw materials in open pits on the side. It's on about 58 acres. There was also a housing development next door, a, a beautiful brand new, 
uh, elementary school, the houses were all evacuated. They, uh, they raised the neighborhood, they tore down the, the new elementary school and they started taking away these materials, but they were finding in the process, they were contaminating the water. So what they did for the remediation for this, they made a barrier wall with a site cover. I don't know if it's made of concrete or what, and it's got groundwater uh, flow control and then they monitor it. And then they come back every five years and test everything and um, contaminants reclaimed or petrochemicals, tars, copper catalysts, ethyl benzene and chlorinated hydrocarbons. So uh, this one was uh, approached in a different way than the RSR site. Um, if you have any questions about soil pollution, Dr. Gorman will be more than happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Fuller. I have a personal relationship with what you just talked about. For 10 years, I taught at Edison Middle School, which is next to the smelter over there. So they came in there and they said, oh, let's get rid of all this contaminated soil. Well, what are we gonna do with it? We're gonna take it down to Ellis County. Well, guess where I live? Ellis County. So they just gathered it up over there and followed me to Ellis County. Now the question came in, why, where are the world's most polluted soil areas? And by far, China. And then it's followed by India, Peru, Russia, and Zimbabwe. Those are places where you don't want to live. And they've had some of these programs on television about China. And believe me, the air, soil, and water uh, is horrible in some of those areas over there. And uh, now, uh, Miss Nash is going to tell you about water pollution. Hello, welcome to my classroom. So water pollution, okay. We all need to drink water, the plants need water. Clean water is important. It's basic to life, okay. For all the living things on our planet. Let's look at a few pictures and think about it. The beginning, there we go, there we go. Okay, so, so again, um, we're starting to use one of our point and non-point sources and this applies also to water pollution. So lots of non-point sources like for that, when Mr. Monroe was talking about nitrites and water coming from houses and fertilizers, from cropland, from streets, so lots of those. And then we've got different kinds of plants or uh, huge plant that might empty out. So these are point sources, okay? Factory farming, animal feedlots are a tremendous source of that nitrite pollution, really terrible. So we've got industrial, agricultural, and urban runoff into water. We've got oil spills, this is Texas, okay? The, the uh, Deepwater Horizon, okay? They catch fire, they spew oil out, we've got all kinds of oil, um, oil spills from um, the drilling from ships running aground, a terrible problem. Oil and water don't mix in more ways than one. Here in Texas, we've got fracking and they keep saying this is a good idea because natural gas is so much cleaner. Well, it's also emitting a lot of methane in the drilling process, which is really bad. But another really dreadful thing about it is water contamination. So they they drill these long pipes down to where they're going to try to get the gas. When they put into it all kinds of mysterious hmm, chemicals and water, and they claim that this water will just be down there forever. But of course, it's going to go through the aquifer. And they'd say, oh, it's contained in this nice cement casing. Well, cement doesn't last forever. It's all going to crack and it's going to contaminate the aquifer. And then if you're on that water well, you can maybe light your water on fire or get really sick. Here's just a few examples of the fracking. Then they also dump a lot of that water on the, on the open 
an open pit, okay? And again, they don't even tell people what is in that water. And this guy's there, and he's wearing protective boots. Of course, animals and birds don't have those boots. And the worst thing of all, one of the worst things of all, is the plastic. And we're all guilty of using plastic. For one month this year, I tried not to use any plastic. It was very, very difficult. So we need to remember that all that plastic that we use and then dispose of, hopefully we're recycling it. But a lot of it is not getting recycled. And it's ending up in the ocean or other waterways. And it's going to be in the um, food chain. Here are just a few pictures of some plastic pollution. Okay, and if you go down to White Rock Lake after a big rain and walk along the shore, you can see something quite similar to this. And all that plastic is coming from upstream. Another thing to remember is that we all live downstream from somebody else. Okay, and so it's our job not to throw stuff out the window. Okay, when we're done with it, because there it is. It's on the lake. There's a lake. It's in the ocean. Just unbelievable. In the city street okay, of Mumbai. And the kind of insidious, we can pick up those big bits, but it's kind of, it breaks down. So plastic doesn't decompose like a piece of paper would, an organic matter would, but it breaks into smaller bits. And those bits get in the food chain, that microplastic. Okay? And it's in every everything that's in the ocean. And if we're eating those fish from the ocean, it's in us too. Lots of innocent victims, whales, and the poor albatross feed their chicks and they're feeding them plastic. And then the chick just dies. So we need to remember that water is life for all the inhabitants of planet Earth. And we need to learn about water issues in our community and beyond. Everyone needs to get involved, do your own part, and educate others. So what can you do? Don't use another plastic water bottle. Okay. Get a, a permanent water bottle and fill it up at the faucet. Our water is really good quality here in, in Texas. Okay, It's a myth that you have to drink that water from the special water bottle, okay? And an added thing to just let you know that the best city water in the US is actually New York City, because they get their water from the Adirondack Forest. The watershed is protected. Okay? And so nature is cleaning their water and they have really excellent water quality in New York City. And just last night, I saw another shocking bit of water pollution. They found, well, 10 years ago, one of the professors at the university in Los Angeles was diving and they found all these barrels, big, or big barrels, industrial barrels of dumped in the ocean. And they've been going back and counting them. And there are hundreds, thousands of these, and they're full of D to Z. And so they were just dumping them out there. So it's all around us and people need to be held responsible when they're doing the dumping. And we also need to take our own responsibility to do what we can okay, to eliminate the use of particularly plastic and petroleum products in general. Thank you. If you have any questions, you can ask Dr. Wong. Yes, the student says, give us a brief definition of water pollution. Uh, Ms. Nash covered it pretty well, but this is brief. Water pollution is the contamination of water bodies, usually as a result of human activities, as she said. Water body bodies include, for example, lakes, rivers, oceans, aquifers, and groundwater. Water pollution results when contaminants are introduced into the natural environment. And now, Mr. Broughton is going to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Dr. Norman. Yes, we have a guest speaker um, with us today. Her name is Miss Watkins, and she works at the um, Texas Commission on Environmental Quality. Their website is tceq.texas.gov. And if you ever need to find out um, how we protect our air, land, and water here in Texas, that is a great um, resource to use because that's what the Texas Commission on Environmental Equality does is they help us take care of the 
land, air, and water. So now I'm going to turn it over to Miss Watkins, who is going to um, explain how we protect Texas waters. Here at the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality, we take our job of protecting Texas waters very seriously. It's our job to ensure that all Texans have access to clean drinking water. So we monitor the water quality from the source to your sink. Hi, I'm Crystal, a public water supply work leader for TCEQ. I started out as a drinking water investigator where my job was to test the water of Texans in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Now, I manage 10 other investigators. I fell into the environmental field, but I can't imagine doing anything else. Our team regulates over 700 water systems in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. My team's work can take many forms, from investigating water treatment plants to making house calls when residents have problems with their water supply. Our water can be polluted from a variety of sources as it travels to your faucet. TCEQ scientists monitor our water supply every step of the way. Scientists define sources of pollution as originating from either point or non-point sources. Point source pollution is introduced into the environment at a singular discharge point, like a pipe, or a specific location, like a manufacturing facility. Non-point source pollution is difficult to control because it comes from everywhere. There are dozens of activities that expose water sources to contamination. Some of these activities include leaking septic tanks, homeowners applying fertilizers and pesticides to their lawns, people not picking up after their dogs, and cars leaking oil. An example of how we protect our natural water supply is through the Edwards Aquifer Protection Program. They ensure that contaminants don't enter the water table by assessing locations that might allow pollutants to enter our groundwater. After water is collected from the source, my team comes in to ensure that the water is safe for human consumption. We look for things like breaks in the pipes, checking for adequate water pressure and chlorine, ensuring adequate treatment of untreated water, and confirming that the water system is complying with state regulations. There are several different types of pollutants that can enter our waters. Some are harmless, while others are more dangerous to the environment or can cause negative health impacts to humans. Physical contaminants primarily impact the appearance or other properties of water. For example, soil erosion can cause sediments or organic materials to become suspended in lakes and streams. Also, heavy rains can deposit large amounts of contaminants into bodies of water, making them harder to treat. Chemical contaminants are elements or compounds that may be naturally occurring or human-made. Examples of chemical contaminants include nitrogen, metals, and human or animal drugs. Fertilizers, pesticides, animal waste, and other harmful substances can wash into our waterways. Biological contaminants refer to microbes such as bacteria, viruses, protozoans, and parasites. These can originate from leaking septic systems or areas with livestock. Radiological contaminants can occur naturally or result from human activity. They can become unstable over time and be harmful to living tissue if ingested or absorbed. Interestingly, some locations in Texas have naturally occurring radiation in their groundwater. When we are testing a site, we use a handheld testing kit like this one. The kit analyzes drinking water to see if it has the right amount of disinfectant, such as chlorine. We usually collect samples and bottles and then send them to the lab for further analysis. My analyzer tests for multiple parameters at one time, allowing us to conduct our investigations accurately and quickly. Chem keys, which look similar to a microchip, are used with the machine and each chem key has a different reagent it can test for. To use the kit, you first identify the water source that you wish to test. You then peel back the packaging to show the end of the chem key and insert the end of that chem key into any slot on the SL1000. Rinse the sample cup with the water sample and fill the sample cup to the fill line with water. Put the meter into the sample cup 
and wait for the sound alert to remove the meter. Finally, you just wait for the measurement to complete. If we see something that needs further analysis, we will collect water in bottles to send off to the lab. When we get results back from the lab, they typically look like this and are calculated in milligrams per liter. This data helps us determine if some type of contamination has occurred in the drinking water. The scientists at TCEQ ensure that our water is protected from pollutants, but we need every Texan to help. Dispose of your waste properly, especially if it's hazardous. Don't overwater your lawn to prevent erosion and runoff pollution. Use pesticides and fertilizer safely by following the label's directions. And teach your family and friends about why it's important to take care of our environment. All right, I'd like to give a uh, special thank you to the Texas Commission on Environmental Equality for working with us on this virtual field trip today, and especially to Crystal Watkins for telling us what she does to help protect water here in Texas. And now I'm gonna turn things back over to Dr. Gorman to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Broughton. And again, thank you, Texas Commission on Quality Control for that great program about the water. We were, we're really learning a lot about what we just take for granted on some of these programs and all. And now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, during this virtual field trip, students explored the impact of human activities on the environment. Students investigated causes and types of air, soil, and water pollution, including point and non-point sources. Mr. Monroe told you about water quality. Ms. Ramirez about air pollution, Ms. Fuller covered soil pollution, Ms. Nash water pollution, and we have a special program uh, about water quality and water testing. And all, uh, thank you. Teachers, how did we do? If you would, go to www.towny.cc slash EEC feedback, fill out a very short form and send it back to us. Thank you again for joining us. You guys have a great rest of the day. Get ready for the storms tonight. But most importantly, I want you to have a great rest of your life. Thank you for being with us.